There are those who say that human beings can be divided into one of two groups. On the one hand, you have those who use Apple products. And on the other hand, you have vile and evil sinners. <laughs> I don't know which one of those groups you belong to, but if that's true, I'm headed for a front row seat in the kingdom. <laughs> Somebody stopped me after first service, Dr. Calvin Thompson, and said, you don't actually realize how true that is. I said, what do you mean? He said, do you know that they have done brain imaging, brain scans? And one of the interesting things they have found in brain scans of those who use Apple products is that the parts of the brain that light up when they get their new Apple products are the same parts of the brain that light up with religious experience. I said, are you serious? He said, I'm absolutely serious. That's a bit scary, but it's apparently true. Now, if you're still wondering whether or not Apple has had an impact on our planet, I want you to consider this. The reality is that Apple is a company that is now worth, by solid estimates, in excess of $700 billion. Now, just to be able to sort through what that means, because all those zeros may have our minds a little bit foggy. I want to read you something written by Brian Wolf on the Internet about Apple. He writes, there's no doubt about it, Apple is worth a lot of money. So much, in fact, that Apple's market capitalization is now worth more than some countries, according to Fortune magazine. Valued at $733 billion at the start of trading today, he wrote on February 12 of this year, Apple is worth more than any one of these single realities. It's worth more than the gross national product of Switzerland. It's worth more than the entire Spanish stock market. Worth more than Google and Microsoft combined. Worth more than four Apollo space programs. And worth more than 20 national football leagues, not teams, leagues. He finishes, earlier this week, Apple became the first U.S. company to be worth $700 billion. Now, with all due respect to Mr. Wolf, there are those who disagree with him, who say that the actual number is Apple is worth in excess of $1 trillion. Now, those kinds of numbers are simply impossible for most of us to compute. I mean, as you did your checkbook this last week, you didn't have that many zeros in the entire checkbook, probably. I certainly didn't. So it's, it's difficult to compute. So think about it this way. You could probably travel most anywhere in the world. They used to say what you would always find was Coca-Cola and things like that. Nowadays, almost anywhere you go in the world, you will find people on their Apple iPhone. It has had a profound impact on our world, so much so that some say it's not just a, a, a company that represents capitalism. It's actually a company that has changed capitalism. How so, you might ask? Well, in this simple way, capitalism has said, if we make it, they'll buy it. Find out what they want, make it, sell it. That's capitalism. But Apple has said, wait a minute, they don't know what they want, so innovate. Imagine, and then everyone will buy it. It has proven to be true. Now, my question this morning is this. Can the church of Jesus Christ, this body of believers that we call the church, learn something from Apple? Is it possible to learn something from a capitalistic company that has made more money than most companies will ever make? Is it possible that the church could learn something from Apple? Well, Apple certainly has some very sound business principles, some sound mottos by which it lives. For example, one motto it has is keep it simple. Very important for Steve Jobs. Keep it simple. Don't want anything complicated. Another mantra they had was, whatever it is that we develop, whatever it is that we make, it must be easy to use. We don't want complicated technology. We want the ordinary man, the ordinary woman to be able to use it. It must be easy to use. Another business model they have had has been, we want anyone who comes into the Apple store to have a very good experience and experience great customer service, kind of like Nordstrom. 
Or what about this one? Apple says, we're not going to make a product unless we know we can make it better than the competition. So those are all principles by which Apple has lived and thrived. Maybe there's something in there that we could sort through and learn and apply in the church setting. Or what about this one? I got a text this week, originated from Michael Walter, who's a member here at our church. I have it, this text now on my iPhone. He said, <laughs> reading a new book that just came out called Team of Teams, and ran across this quote, found it interesting, thought it might be useful. Here's what it says. I once asked, says the author, I once asked Steve Jobs, often mistakenly considered a lone visionary and authoritarian leader, which of his creations made him the most proud? I thought he might say the original Macintosh or the iPhone. Instead, he pointed out that these were all collaborative efforts. The creations he was most proud of, he said, were the teams he had produced. Starting with the original Macintosh team working under a pirate flag in the early 1980s and the remarkable team he had assembled by the time he stepped down from Apple in 2011. Today's rapidly changing world, marked by increased speed and dense interdependencies, means that organizations everywhere are now facing dizzying challenges from global terrorism to health epidemics to supply chain disruption to game-changing technologies. These issues can be solved only by creating sustained organizational adaptability through the establishment of a team of teams. That's worth paying attention to. Maybe that's what we learn from Apple. Maybe that's what we draw from T Steve Jobs, the importance of teams, that nobody in the Christian church is a lone wolf. We all work in community. But there is one other reality, one other reality that as I thought about Apple and thought about what the church might be able to learn from Apple, for me, rose to the top of the list of priorities almost immediately. It is this one. At Apple, the engineers say, we will develop no product that we ourselves aren't prepared to use. If we're not going to use it, we're not going to develop it. Because we're not just about selling products out of a store. This is our life. In fact, a writer named Tim Bajaran, writing in Time magazine, magazine about that very issue, says this. So many times with projects I do with other tech companies, the goal is almost always based around technology first, followed by whether or not people really want to use it. Geeky engineers are dazzled by the technology at their disposal and often create something because they can. But Apple's approach is quite different, says Bajaran. The engineers who are creating Apple products actually make them for themselves. And Steve Jobs was the chief user of Apple products while he was alive. All of Apple's products are based on the fact that Jobs himself represented the real customer. And his engineers had to come to grips with that when designing a product. It has to be something. Listen to these words. It has to be something they cannot personally live without. Did you hear that last line? Here the engineers are. Here they are developing the products that will sell. And of that they say, it has to be something we can't live without. I think there's something in that for the church. Because what it is saying is that what they develop, what they invent, what they sell is deep and real and personal. It affects their life. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture this morning where Jesus has something to say about religion and whether or not it is deep and real and personal to us. You can find the passage in Matthew chapter 6, page 1442, if you're reaching for a pew Bible, 1442. Matthew chapter 6. As you turn there, you will find that it is at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. 
We come in this section of the Sermon on the Mount to a section about 18 verses long where Jesus is talking about personal piety. In other words, the practice of one's religious faith. And he has some rather pointed things to say. In ancient Judaism, there were at least three acts that were central to the piety and the practice of a Jewish believer. Central, critical to their actions. One was almsgiving, the giving of, 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 to the needs of the poor. The second was prayer. The third was fasting. Those were bound up in the life of a religious person. Jesus has apparently been observing how the people around him practice their religion. And he has zeroed in, he has focused in on some of the conservative believers known as Pharisees and how they were practicing their religious faith. And he has something very pointed to say about it. In fact, what he says in this section will be divided into two pieces for each of those acts, for almsgiving, for prayer, and for fasting. Two pieces. The first, he gives a critique of what he has observed of how that's being practiced. And then secondly, he gives a recommendation. This then is how I actually want you to do it. I want to begin by just reading the critiques. So we're going to read about all three of the practices, what he has to say as he critiques how religion is happening in their lives. So Matthew 6, we begin reading with verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now down to verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And now verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. If I understand Jesus correctly, what he is saying is it is possible to be a religious person. It's possible to look religious, to act religious, to sound religious. It is possible to be a religious person in the view of everyone around us. And yet, if given the opportunity to peer into the heart of that person, we would find this is not personal and real and deep. This is, as it were, just a job. I'm just doing it because that's what needs to be done. There's a word Jesus uses for each one of those to describe that action. It's the Greek word hypocrites, from which we get our English word hypocrite. You notice that in each example he used the words, he says, don't be like the hypocrite who who likes to give and announce the fact that he's giving so everybody can zero in and say, oh my goodness, look at all he gave to that poor person. Don't be, he said, like the hypocrite who stands up in the synagogue above all the others and who prays very piously. Don't be like the hypocrite, he says, who when fasting staggers around hunched over. It's the third day of my fast. Don't be like that, Jesus says, because there's one word with which I can describe each one of those people, and it's the word hypocrite. It's not real. It's not deep. It's not personal. It's just for show. In fact, literally so. Because the Greek word hypocrites came straight out of Greek theater. The Greek hypocrites was the Greek actor. On the stage of the Greek play, there they were, the actors, playing their roles. And the audience that had come celebrated what they did. They knew those people were just playing a role. That wasn't real. It wasn't personal. That's not who they were. They were playing a role for the enjoyment, for the approval of the audience that had gathered. They applauded. They celebrated. 
And Jesus says, if that's what you're doing when it comes to your religion, the applause you receive is all the reward you get. The word he uses is out of the business world. It's a word that we would translate today by saying uh, somebody had taken, an employee had taken a stamp on the bill and it said, paid in full. So that applause that you get, he says, even in the religious arena, that's all you're getting paid in full. What if we were to use that word hypocrite in the same way today that it was used in, in, in its origin in the Greek theater? It might sound something like this. We, we would watch a movie together, a good movie, maybe Unbroken or, or Selma. And when the movie is over and we walk away from the experience, we say to each other, oh, my goodness, that was incredible hypocrisy. Oh, my goodness. They were wonderful hypocrites. They ought to win an Academy Award for that hypocrisy. And we all say, yes, absolutely so. And Jesus says, all right, go ahead, give them the award. That's all they're getting because it's not real and personal and deep. So what if that were to be translated over into the business world? You know what it might look like? It might look like something like this. You go down to the Apple store to get a new phone. You're going to get the iPhone 6, latest version. You're excited about it. You walk in the store. They assign you the person who's going to help you. turns out to be Johnny. Young man. He's helpful. He's intelligent, bright, eager, quick, answers all your questions, shows you all the features. You're pretty excited about it. This is exactly what you've been looking for. You're just pulling your credit card out of your wallet. When you think of one last question, you say, oh, tell me, Johnny, do you have the iPhone 6 or the iPhone 6 Plus? He says, oh, no, 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 no. I have the Samsung Galaxy, the S6. I love my Samsung. And you say, what? And you stick your credit card back in your wallet and say, thank you very much. And you walk out realizing, this is just a job. All that stuff he told me, I don't even know if he believes it. Jesus said, the word I would use for that is hypocrite. A rough term. What was it that Bajaran said? He said, the Apple engineers will only develop that which they can't live without. Deep, personal, real. This is going to change my life or else I won't know part of it. It's worth pondering that. Pondering what that means to us in our walk with Jesus. This experience we have with God called the Christian journey. This experience we have in community called the church. It's worth asking ourselves some questions. Is this an experience that is deep and personal and real? Is this something that moves into our lives and upends our order of priorities so that no other priority can claim the place of ultimate? Oh, we have many other priorities, but none gets the ultimate place. Then this, this journey with Jesus, this walk with God, this community of faith called church. It's worth, it's worth it for we as church members to ask ourselves that question. Am I willing to say, this is something of which I will be a part because I can't live without it? Wish the church were more like Apple. In fact, I want to go back and read more from that Matthew 6 passage. I want to go back and read not only the part where Jesus offers his critique, but I want to read the part where he offers his recommendation, what to do about it instead. But as I read about it, I'm not going to read about it from today's New International Version. Instead, I'm going to read about it from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase called The Message. I've chosen to read it out of 
the message because he captures in contemporary language and images what I think Jesus was driving at. Makes me think if Jesus were here today and were to have delivered his Sermon on the Mount in the 21st century, these are probably the kinds of images he would have used. So listen to what Peterson says in Matthew 6. Be especially careful when you're trying to be good so you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure, play actors, I call them, treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom, do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role-play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense His grace. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. He'll reward you well. I think if I could summarize what Jesus is driving at there, if I could use business terms, I would say he's saying, I'm not interested in somebody who just works in the store and sells the product. And that's all the interest they have in it, but their life is actually given to some other product, some other reality, somewhere else. What I am looking for is people who will fully give of themselves so that what they experience here, what they sell here, is what they live. Kind of like Apple says. We'll develop no device. We'll develop no product that we ourselves could live without. What we're looking for is what will change our lives and then yours as well. Now, they're doing it for a temporal device. Have they succeeded? Well, ask yourself the question. How far do you get from your phone? How many times do you check it a day? How many text messages? How many times on the phone? Has it changed your life? That's what Jesus is actually talking about here. He doesn't want something that's just an outward display, an outward show, just a job. Rather, he asks us some questions. In fact, I think maybe we could summarize the images and the metaphors and the questions he asks into this one question that I ask of you, that I ask of me. And that is this. Are we willing for our relationship with Jesus, our communal life, to be of that caliber that we will participate in it because it is life-changing, because we can't live without it. That's the community of Christ. That's this creation of his called the church. He envisions no lone wolf Christians, but everybody given to the body that becomes the source of life for every one of us. It's worth asking ourselves some questions using the, the imagery that he uses in this verse. It's worth asking, what is my life like when I'm out of the spotlight, when no one is watching? Is my devotion just as real, just as full, just as complete? Or do I need an audience? Do I need to know people are watching? 
What happens to me when I get away from the all-seeing eye of others? What am I like when I'm alone? These are probing questions posed by what Jesus here says. So I have to ask myself, I have to ask you, does your day begin with him? Does it end with him? Is his presence throughout your day a reality that you never quite forget? Are your deepest and sweetest thoughts of him? Has he actually moved in and changed the person you are? Are the people around you able to say, you know, there's a difference in her. He's not quite what he used to be. Hasn't been dramatic, but slowly over time, they're becoming more patient, more real, more kind, more loving. That's the life-changing kind of relationship Jesus desires. He desires with it each one with it each one of us individually, but he desires it with us as a community of faith. So what can the church learn from Apple? Well, I'll tell you, after considering many different facets, many different realities about Apple, I've come to this conclusion. Whether you like Apple or not, whether you use Apple products or not, at least this is undeniable. Apple has changed the way we live our lives, the way we communicate, the way we listen to music, the way we get news, the way we watch movies. It has changed our lives in so many ways. And from what I can read, one of the key principles... At the heart of that change, societal change, is this one. We will invent and develop and sell no product unless we ourselves can't live without it. I wonder how it is when it comes to the church. Are we able, are we willing to sell out in that fashion? I wonder. I wonder what it would be if this one church, this one local expression of the body of Christ were to say, the reality is we take this so seriously that we cannot live without it. It is real. It is deep. It is personal. 